API linting is a topic that is becoming more and more important because the number of APIs is growing constantly and people want to have nicely coherent API landscapes. So how can you do API linting? And today we look at a new and interesting way. And with me today is Aiden Kniff of Optic. Hey, Aiden, thanks for joining. Hey, Eric, thanks for having me. Yeah, so, so we recently chatted about linting and you talked about this new thing that you were working on and which now has been released at least as a beta, which works with um, ChatGPT. So it works with uh, natural language linting. And I think the interesting thing that we have here is that currently most people probably use Spectral or similar engines. And um, this could actually be kind of a nice, let's say, extension of what you can do. Um, but first, let's talk a little bit about linting in general. So you do that a lot. I think it's, it's a big part of, of what Optic does. So how would you describe linting as a general facility and, and why is it picking up so much um, in, in the API space? Yeah, so I think uh, today we have large companies with uh, dozens or hundreds of internal APIs, um, a few external APIs too, or partner APIs. And you want to have consistency and you know similar design patterns across all of them to make them accessible to consumers, to your internal teams. Um, and there's only really like two ways of getting consistency. Uh, you can create a bottleneck and have every single API change go through like one or two people who are going to check to make sure it's consistent. Or you can try to share that knowledge with your team. Um, and it's really hard to share that knowledge because uh, you can send out a big PDF. Um, Someone has to read that and then sort of internalize it and then learn how to do it the right way. Um, or you can meet developers where they are and give them feedback as they're writing code and open API files. Um, and I think everyone wants to do a great job. They want to ship a consistent API. So if you just give them the feedback at the right time of the process, um, developers are really likely to do the right thing. So that's what linting is really all about is just sharing that knowledge so you don't need to have bottlenecks on your team. Yeah, and the, the PDF version typically doesn't work so great, right? Because people have to read it to understand it. And then if you update the PDF, people have to reread it and understand what you change. And I think this is really what, what kind of gave rise to spectral and, and similar things that allow you to do linting in a little bit more, let's say, scalable way and, and machine um, supported way. So when we look at linting that way, what would you say, what did spectral change? Yeah, so I think Spectral did a great job of creating um, a format for writing like some some pretty obvious rules. So you can check things like the naming conventions, the metadata in the spec. Did you use the spec properly or did you make a mistake? Um, but I think it's always been difficult for teams to write like more advanced rules. So when we came to the scene with Arlinter uh, two years ago, what we started doing was helping people write rules about breaking changes, which is something that has always been hard to do, about versioning policies, about the style of pagination. So, so really creating ways of going a lot deeper. Um, and I think that's really where teams want to get to is they want as much of this stuff to be automated as they can so they can focus their manual reviews on more important design choices. Um, there's a, there's a trade-off there though, which is if you automate things and you're too strict with your rules or the rules aren't written very well, you're going to start creating false positives uh, and false negatives all over the place. And that's not good either. So I think you, you move the engineering pro you move sort of this people problem to an engineering problem and engineering problems sometimes are hard to solve. Yeah, that's very true. Just, just out of curiosity. So, so you also work a lot, I, I would assume with customers who are using spectral or, or looking at spectral, how many, I mean, it's hard to quantify, but like how many rules do you hear about where people are saying, we really would like to check this, but we don't know how, or we're pretty sure we cannot do this with spectral or similar engines. It comes up all the time. Um, I think that might be because our company is trying to make it easier to check more. So like my funnel is people who have that problem. Uh, so I might not have like a, a clear sample, um, but it comes up pretty much in every conversation. Uh, I think there's two reasons why people aren't able to automate more rules. Uh, the first is because it, they are expensive to write. Sometimes you need like a full-time engineer to write these rules. Um, and then they also uh, have weird behavior when you apply them to legacy APIs. You could write a brand new style guide, turn it on um, on your new APIs and everyone's really happy. But if you turn it on for the legacy APIs, then all these people are stuck in a catch-22 where if they meet the style guide, they break the consumer. So you now have two things in conflict. 
Um, so one of our big innovations when we were talking to teams, they were telling us like, hey, we're, we're turning off our rules. We wrote them, but we're turning them off. So we set up a very simple flag you can turn on that makes it so that Optic only applies the rules to new stuff in the spec. So you can use it on legacy APIs, on new APIs. And that's a, those are the kinds of things that have made this easier. So I'd say like half the problem is writing the rule and then half the problem is like knowing when to run it. Um, and if you make it easier to do both those things intelligently, you can scale your governance up a whole lot. Okay. Today, I will not talk about knowing when to run it because I think that's a fascinating conversation in itself. And I, I really want to talk about this more deeply. I just, just this week, I was at a, at a conference and somebody talked about this very thing where they said, you know, we wrote this world set, we had a lot of APIs, and then we ran it against the APIs that we have, and we ended up with 60,000 warnings. <laughs> it's like, okay, what now? <laughs> so, okay, but um, what we'll do today is more talk about how to write the rules. And, and what you've done is you came up with an interesting way of how you can evaluate rules in a different way where it's not so mechanistic against you write a rule that checks the, the, the YAML or the JSON of the specification, but it's more based around ChatGPT and natural language processing. Can you briefly walk us through the idea and, and the execution? Like how, how does that way of checking um, or linting an open API specification work? Yeah, so one of the uh, interesting things when we onboard a new customer is they will almost always send us a PDF uh, of a bullet point list of the rules that they have. And there's a period of time where either their engineers or some of the people on our customer support team are helping to turn those um, bullet points into actual rules. Um, and when ChatGDP came out, we were trying to think of ways to use it uh, in the API space. And one of the logical ideas that came out of this is like, well, what if we could, you know, skip that middle step and we don't have to actually write the rule? What if we just go from the bullet points they already have that are easy for a developer to read to actually enforcing that against the spec? Um, and the first thing we tried was to generate rules from the um, bullet points. But the problem with that is uh, the models were like so-so and, you know, they kind of work, they kind of don't. Um, and, but, but, uh, but the other thing we realized is that you can actually ask these models about things you could never write code for. So, uh, you know, one of the rules that someone has been trying to do for a long time at one of our customers is um, make sure that you never use a 200 response as an error status. Um, you can write that as a bullet point, but it's really hard to think about how you'd write a spectral rule for that. Like you could have keywords like error or code or issue or warning. And like, if it's in there, you, you kill it and you're not allowed to put that out, uh, like return that from the API. But you're basically like fly swatting. You're going after every time you saw someone do it wrong um, <laughs> instead of saying what's right and having people do that. Um, and when we started to skip that middle step and just have the model evaluate the open API and the rule, um, it started to do really well at that stuff. That was super ambiguous. So you could never write code for So at first we thought this was just a time-saving thing. And now we're realizing it actually helps you um, enforce rules you could never even write with code if you tried. Um, and that's been the really exciting thing is just seeing how customers have used it the last couple of weeks and turn on some of this functionality like we never expected to be able to do with a linter. Yeah, I, that, that for me was really kind of my first thought when you talked about it because I, you know, it, it's clear that Spectral or other similar approaches have a limited capability to capture rules. And there, there are a lot of these a little bit un, not so standard rules, right, that are really hard to capture. And I, I, I would think that if you do it the way you do, you just have a, another set of rules you can um, enforce. And, and that is a really interesting, um, I think a really interesting thing to take into account as somebody who wants to enforce this kind of coherence across APIs. So now can you explain and also show us a little bit how that works? Because I think it's really interesting. And it, in the end, it's very simple, right? So you, you have a human readable rule and you have your open API specification and then ChatGPT tells you yes or no, more or less. It's basically that. Yeah, yeah. You've, uh, you've designed it in a mouthful. Uh, nice job. All right. Yeah. Let me, uh, let me share my screen real quick and I can pop this mm -hmm. into VS Code. Cool. Uh, so this is, uh, this is an open API file I have for a simple bookstore API. Uh, this is an example we use a lot at Optic. And then I also have my optic.yaml file. And all I've done here is configure um, six rules using natural language. Uh, so here's the example I shared earlier, uh, 2xx response codes. 
um, must not return things that look like errors. Uh, I have a rule against responses that return arrays. Um, I have a fun one here. Properties that sound like their dates should use format, date, time, or timestamp, um, and a, a few others underneath that. And to actually run this, um, all I have to do is run optic diff like I normally would for any other rule in optic. And it will evaluate this and actually um, give me results here in my console, uh, but also in the optic UI. Um, so I can see um, I can see that it found that rule about naming um, IDs more specifically. So using things like user ID instead of the word ID, it told me that I should add format date time or timestamp to these two dates. Uh, and it figured out that this number property that I set up doesn't have a default or a minimum. And that's something that we said was really important. Um, so it ran through very quickly, took everything in my spec, took all these natural language rules and compared them to each other um, and gave me you know, quick results about um, my API's design without me having to actually go write a spectral rule or an optic rule to do it. Mm -hmm. So you're using the standard OpenAI API. I always love saying that. And um, yeah. So, so one of the limitations uh, that, that it, this is famous for, so to speak, is that it's relatively limited in terms of how much data you can put into it. And typically, API specifications can get pretty sizable. How do you get around that? Yeah, so the way we figured that out, um, and, and you're absolutely right, that's, that's the biggest limitation of the models today and the hardest engineering challenge. Um, but what we've done basically is, is run this in two passes. So on the first pass, we look at every single rule and we figure out what is this rule about? So this rule is about responses. Uh, so is this rule also about responses? This rule is about properties. And this rule is also about properties. Uh, this rule is about operations. This rule is about number properties. So we're, we're able to go through and basically classify what part of the spec each rule cares about. And then what we do <clears throat> is we chunk um, different parts of the open API spec, like uh, just the created at and just the updated at uh, block here with some additional context. And we ask ChatGTP, does this example of a property follow the rule? Uh, does this example of a response follow the rule? Um, and that allows it to respond really quickly, not use too much of the context window. So we stay below that sort of threshold they have. Um, and it allows us to ask all of these you know, abstract English uh, questions about whether or not the API is following the standard that we set. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's clever. And I guess that also means that at least in theory right now, there is no upper limit to the open API descriptions that you can, that you can work on. Yeah. So we, um, so obviously the, the biggest, you know, a consideration that we have here with the customers who are currently using it is making sure that we keep the cost and the time down a lot. So um, Optic runs in a lot of people's CI pipelines. We don't want to slow the CI pipelines down. Um, but if we have a, you know, 10,000, you know, line specification, it can take two, three minutes to run. Uh, just that's a limitation of ChatGDP being slow and the rate limits and things like that. Um, so what we do is after we run each rule, we try our best to sort of save the output. Um, and then we only need to run the rules again if the API changes or if the rules change. Uh, so that first time might add a few minutes to your pipeline, but then after that, it should only take a second or two. Um, so it's a lot of those kinds of design things you have to do when you're building um, with the OpenAI APIs, because it's just unlike a lot of other uh, APIs that you use, it, it's slow and it's expensive, and that's usually not the case. Now. That sounds like a like a very reasonable approach. You're kind of warming up your knowledge, right? And then you need to keep it warm somewhere. And as long as it's there, it's working for you. So uh, thanks a lot. That's that's really interesting. And I think it's something that for a lot of people, they might just think it's like, hmm, yeah, maybe I can do things differently um, from before. One, one final question I have for you, because I, I really like this kind of alternative way of thinking about linting. I mean, you just launched it, so I guess you still need to capture a little bit more experiences with it. But would you say that in the long run, this could just replace the, the more formal ways of, of rule uh, of linting like spectral? Or would you think that this might always be something that's more complementary and you might have both types of linting because both do different things and might be 
better in one case and not so good in the other? I think in the short term, uh, they're complementary. I think these rules really excel in the kinds of things that you would not want to write a spectral rule for. Things that are really hard to do with code or require like basically that fly swatting approach where you get all the negative cases out. Um, <clears throat> so that's where I think they work well today. Um, if you have really important things like security considerations, you should probably write a real rule for that uh, because you don't want the security part of your thing to be subject to a hallucinating LLM. Um, so I would say like for those kinds of mission critical rules, don't use this at all. Um, but uh, I can't imagine the models not getting better every single year. Um, and I'm pretty sure these kinds of problems where we're trying to translate you know, our definition of good onto a representation in code um, I can't imagine that being something we're writing real rules for in two years. I think the fact that everyone starts with a bullet list tells us a lot about what the end state is going to be. And as the technology uh, <laughs> collapses closer to that being possible, I, it's really hard for me to imagine companies not just having their bullet list of standards that's easy to read, easy to update, and easy to enforce mm -hmm. with tools like this in the middle. You mentioned that magical word hallucination. There is another magical word in the Gen AI space, which is non-determinism. Um, how how would you think about this? You know, where if you rerun the your rules like ten times, like sometimes it says this, sometimes it says that. Is that a risk that you see, or not so much? So, OpenAI um, allows you to set the temperature, which is sort of like the noise that you put into the model in the beginning that induces different levels of uh, variation in the responses. You can set that number to zero. And if it's set to zero, it'll be deterministic, uh, plus or minus one weird NVIDIA error that sometimes causes one extra word to come out at the end, according to Reddit. Um, but for the most part, you can make this deterministic. And then the other side of that too is we're also saving the outputs and not rerunning it um, multiple times. So um, just the way we're caching this to make sure that it's performant and cheap to run, um, should also provide more determinism since we're just using a database to do that. That's true. But then kind of, then it's almost not caching anymore, right? Because you're, <laughs> because you're just saving these things. And in the end, they actually might give you different results if you reevaluated them, but that's, that's good enough for me. Thanks a lot. I think that's, you know, that should keep us uh, sleeping at night. Um, so, yeah, I think this is really interesting and I would like to, you know, if you found that interesting, um, check out the, the, you have a demo that you have. You also have, I think, documentation for this is online now, if I Yep, there'll be a link correctly. in the description to our, our website and the sign up form if you want to try it out. Yeah. Okay, so I think, you know, it's really something just to keep in mind. If you are using linting and maybe also every now and then you think, oh, it would be nice if I could do this, but I don't know how to do it with the engine I'm using. Maybe that's something to consider that this could be just could become a new way of how linting is being done in the future. So linting in the future. That's, uh, I like that. Um, Aiden, thanks so much for uh, joining um, and, and giving us this demo. I think it was really an, an interesting new way of how to get stuff done in the API space. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me, Eric. Look forward to being on again sometime. Yes, we will have to talk about that second part that we skipped somewhere in the middle. Um, thanks everybody for watching and if you liked it, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing and until the next time, keep getting APIs to work. Bye everybody.